Welcome to this very special series brought to you by Straight to the Source and Food South Australia with support from the Department of Trade and Investment. We're coming to you today from the traditional lands of the Ghana people, and we'd like to begin by paying our respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. We've taken our studio on the road to Adelaide, where we're catching up with 10 exciting producers from regions across South Australia to find out what puts them at the forefront of creativity and innovation in food production. It's been really fantastic to spend time in South Australia over the last few days. It's really reinforced the diversity that's on offer here and the outstanding quality across the board. You can feel the connection and collaboration between producers and it's really wonderful because it makes them so much stronger together. Yeah, we've had we've had and heard some fantastic conversations with producers over the last few days and we're really looking forward to sharing their stories with you. And it's been mighty delicious. <laughs> Let's get started. Among the fascinating farmers we spent time with in South Australia, this father-daughter duo are simultaneously innovating and protecting the heritage of South Australia's unique almond market. Debbie Trejanowski, along with her husband, now runs the Taronga Almond Farm, which was started by her parents, Mick and Margaret Jones, in 1992. It's a fabulous family story, and I started by asking, where is this family farm located? The property that we started on is in Salix Hill, is part of the Fleurie Peninsula in South Australia. And when you moved to the property, what year was that? 92. 1992? Yeah. And what, what was growing there? Was it just almonds and then was it a certain variety? No, uh, it was almonds, uh, the old-fashioned Chellistons, Johnsons, and a couple of other varieties that the guy who was, owned it was trying out to see what they were like, but they weren't successful. Um, then we replanted it, like I said. Um, in ni- 92, we pulled out a quarter of the block, which was is a 10-acre block. Um, we pulled out a quarter and replanted it with Summertons, which are a South Australian variety of almond. The Summerton almonds have become quite a popular almond in our region. I believe the story goes that they were discovered in a backyard, a particular tree. I, I don't know how that happens, but <laughs> they liked the tree. So they, I think the word is cultivated it and grafted it or whatever. And now it's become a bit of a South Australian icon almond that is becoming rare to find, but we are actively promoting it to keep that variety alive. And what is the flavour profile of it? We tend to describe the Summerton as slightly crispy on the skin, but really buttery and creamy internally. It has a slightly sweet flavour, but very almondy, very creamy and buttery, makes a beautiful almond milk and almond meals and almond butters because of its creaminess. But that slight sweetness means it doesn't really need anything added to it to bring that natural sweetness about. It's a very special almond. It's also known as a brown skin almond, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. But they're all brown skin, but like Johnson's are exceptionally darker brown and it's hairy. Oh, right. That would be yeah. a good way of describing yeah. the Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> um, the old-fashioned Chalicons, they were a dark brown almond as well, um, but nowhere near got the flavour of the new flavor, new varieties. So obviously when everybody's um, creating or when the farmers are creating these um, newer almonds, one of the important factors is flavour. So as Dad says, the Chalicons are quite known for they don't have the strong almond flavours but they were around a long time ago where the newer varieties, they're always trying to get that, you know, more distinct almond flavours as well as good producing trees, so producing lots of almonds and every year, that kind of thing. So the Summertons and Johnstons, they, like Dad said, they're a brown skin almond. They've got a lot of flavour, so they make a great table nut. You don't have to flavour them, in other words. They can shine all on their own. But the downside of those trees as a farmer is the fact that some years will be dormant and some years they don't flourish as much. Where the newer style varieties, which are more golden in their appearance, they are what we call a bit of like a designer nut where, yeah, that's the one. So that's your newer style varieties that are most people will see in your all stores, health food stores, supermarkets and everything. 
They are uh, a beautiful almond, but they're more golden. They're lighter in flavor and sweet. But most importantly for a farmer, they don't have dormant ears. So they will tend to flourish if the seasons are good and Mother Nature behaves. They'll flourish every single year. What's the ideal conditions for growing almonds? That's what is special about the Flora region. So the Flora region has a Mediterranean-style climate. So we have very wet, cold winters, but then we have nice, dry, hot summers. So Dad has spent 30 years until recently when these retired from farming, tried to. Um, have you really retired? No. From the farming, but... Not the packaging. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Um, he spent 30 years of, you know, it's hard work um, harvesting these because that dry, hot summer is when you harvest. So it's been, it's tough conditions. Yeah, you used to do it out in 35 degree heat and actually that was just under the shade. You, by the time you got out in the sun, which you was working all day and it, it was a lot hotter than that. Yeah, it's it's a tough industry, like that little beautiful almond that people love. There's a lot of work goes into and in tough conditions. So that Mediterranean climate in winter, so Dad would have been pruning leading up and into that winter, it, you know, it's it's very rainy and it's um, very cold and so that's harsh in itself. Um, and then, um, you know, leading into summer, you've got those beautiful, hot, dry summers, just like in Spain where almonds are very popular and I think the Middle East, they're very popular. So, again, cold, wet winters, dry, hot summers, perfect climate. So with the varieties, though, you're blending them as well? Yes, yes. We will tend to use the, the one that you're holding, which is a non pareil almond a paper shell. We'll tend to use that variety for our flavouring. That's more about consistency. Okay. So more of those almonds being around these days and so therefore we get consistency in what we're cooking. But to be honest, roasting a Somerton or a Johnston almond, they're beautiful. They get really quite light and crispy. But because they are an old-fashioned almond, they're not as around as much anymore. So for consistency, that's a bit more difficult. But when it, they are around in that seasonal climate, I would jump on and get a roasted Somerton any day. Can the consumer detect the difference? I mean, yes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I tend to do tastings um, on our market store. And when I explain the difference, you can see it in the customers' faces, the difference and the acknowledgement that they cannot believe there are actually different almonds and that there really is a difference in flavour and texture of the almonds. I remember when we first had a conversation ages ago and we were talking about almonds in the supermarket and the perception of almonds and, and you mentioned something about, well, the ones that you buy often aren't fresh. It's, it's the process of pasteurization. So ours are unpasteurized almonds and they are pesticide-free. What that means is they come off the tree as nature intended, which makes them beautiful and fresh and plump. There's no tampering. So once you tamper with an almond like any product, you've done something to it, it changes the almond. So there may be the same health benefits. I can never dispute that. However, the flavor is not the same. The freshness is not the same. Thank you for clarifying that. It's okay. Because that's a very important point, you know. Well, I can, after being around the family's business for so long and being actually in the business now for the last five years, I can walk around a store and I can tell by visually looking at almonds whether they where they probably come from or whether they've had pasteurization treatment done to them just by the look of the almonds. They they look very different. What is that process of pasteurization? Dad? You know, you've got me. I've, I, never, oh, okay. I never went into it. Yeah. <laughs> it, I, I... it was too costly to do. Okay. Uh, it's an extremely yep. costly process. It's a bit like a, I believe, and I can be corrected on this because I was actually speaking to a gentleman at the trade fair to yesterday yep. about this. I believe it's like a water treatment, uh, a hot gassed water treatment, something like that. Um, and it is to do with, um, you know, health benefits as in salmonella, absolutely, but... 
as long as you, um, you know, you take care of your almonds. Like we store all of our almonds at a very specific temperature and with a very low humidity. So we make sure we look after our produce so that when we supply it to our customers, it's been well looked after, it's in tip-top condition. But So there was a reason for pasteurisation, but luckily in South Australia or in Australia, apparently there was a voting system and you got to choose whether you went down that, that track or not. And that's still the case, obviously. It still is the case to this day. However, for exporting, which is a lot of growers want to export, they will have to have them pasteurised and that's fair enough because they are export market on a bulk level. Are you looking at export? Exporting our flavoured almonds, yes, but not tonnage of almonds. That industry, they'd probably have to have them pasteurised and that's fair enough. That's their market. So what's the biggest challenge you're facing in your business right now and how are you tackling it? Um, That tipple level, would you say, of um, us packing versus outsourcing Mm. into industry? Yeah, you're you're at a point where you've got, do we do mechanical stuff to actually package and whatnot or versus carry on hand doing? Because you're right at that line where it says, well, if... I really need to expand that bit more, but then you've got to do away with people more or less. You've got to have machinery to do it. And it takes more capital. Yes, a lot more. people you pay on an hourly basis Mm. so you can cash flow that. To get the machinery, you need space, you need capital input, um, and you need banks, finance to take you seriously in that area. So there's a lot of hurdle and a lot of risk. If things slow down with staff, we can slow down. But once you've bought a thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar piece of equipment, you've got it. Well, that's where you've so you just better make s- it work. And <laughs> commit to scaling, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. So that's probably, I guess, one of our um, decision making areas at the moment is how to tackle that. And also, like a lot of small businesses, you start out with a passion. For us, it was experience. It was a love of the farm, and wanting to keep that alive. But you might not, when you're a small business, you're a person of many hats, but there's usually a few hats you're not very good at. So things like sales and marketing and that bravery to go and front up into a store and tell them why they should buy your product, what's so different about yours, that's a scary area to someone like me. Well, it is scary. It's scary when you are taking, when you're growing, you're the primary producer, then you're value adding. And you're creating other products based on the almonds. Yes. And then you're looking at, you can't be everything, can you? No. So you go, okay, you put your sales and marketing hat on, you put your packaging hat on, you put all these hats on, and there is a point where you've got to go, all right, do I outsource? Do I build the business up even bigger? And if so, how do I do that? And what's your market? Yeah. And knowing which of those to do, to outsource first. Yeah. Which one's the most important because you're a small business growing. You can only afford to go into so many areas. So it's knowing which is the one you need to do first, next, and then put the pennies towards the next one. And, yeah, do you get the sales or do you get the machine? The machine means we can cope better if we get the sales. The sales gets us the sales to pay. (laughs) (laughs) So so what is your goal? Like are you looking for distribution to get uh, some distributors on board to have your product across Australia or you want to stay on the eastern seaboard? We just want to grow and we want to take fluor almonds, fluor grown almonds as far as possible. I, I truly believe with the history of almonds in the fluor that we really should keep that alive, but not just alive, just people to know, you know. The provenance. The, the, of, yes, the, the story behind almonds grown in the fluor. I feel very passionate about that and also about fair pricing for the farmers in the fluor. Um, I I work with the farmers so that we are paying them what we consider a fair price. Uh, I know the history of my mum and dad when they were growing them in the early days and really the the money barely covering the cost of running the block. It was actually the value adding for them that changed their lives really in farmers markets and I just keep that in the back of my head so that when I'm dealing with the farmers that I work with that I know that I'm for want of a better term, not ripping them off Mm -hmm. just so I can make a dollar. 
that we're all looked after, that the region's looked after and that the history is looked after. That's that community connection, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And, that, and I think Providence. that comes from farmers' markets because you're all in it together at farmers' markets. So we've been a part of the Wollonga Farmers' Market now for around 20 years and that is an absolute community down there from the management down to the stallies, down to the customers. And Wollonga is a – Wollonga, the almonds are a massive part of that history we're huge fans of that farmer's market. You know that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's a beautiful market, I must admit. A little bit biased. but <laughs> So would you say that that was really a springboard for you? I definitely. We were there from day one. Um, without it, we would have still been selling to Almond Co. or the co- co-op. And to be honest, you got peanuts for your money. For one of a better yeah. peanuts for almonds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for your almonds, yeah. They, they, they were literally, it, like Deb said, you barely covered the cost. You was actually working hard all year round and basically breaking even. Uh, if we hadn't have um, gone onto the market at the time and if my wife hadn't have come up with all the different varieties, we would, wouldn't have survived. You just couldn't. Or we'd have still been working because I had a factory job and she was doing curtain hanging uh, making um she gave her job up because she was going into the cooking of sort of and then eventually we got to the point where it we were, had expanded with the markets and the uh, airport um and it eventually i had to give my job up and at that time it was a good paying job uh, but that was a gamble you took and we said the almonds would be a better way of going long term so how many different varieties? Can you walk us through the different varieties? I know we've talked about the flavor, but you were... Yeah. Um, well... In terms of the way you were planting, what made you make those decisions? Um, purely like Deb was saying, the Summertons are a lot more producing tree every year. So they have a larger yield. Yeah, when eventually. And they, as they start to grow, they just continually get better. Uh, Johnson's, once they reach maturity which is these ones, they um, get their biannual. So at one year, like Deb said, you get, them, you get masses of them. Next year, you'll hardly get any of them. But they are, are good pollinators, um, which are essential for the almond business. You've got to pollinate. Um, then we had white brandis, which was basically the almond wasn't that crash hot, but it was a good pollinator. Um, We've got non prels in there now, or when I had the block. We've got non prels We part tried Wild Colony, which was a replacement for the Johnsons uh, because you was finding it hard to get Johnson trees anymore. Mm. So it, it's a progressive changeover because purely because they go out of style. You know, mm. people love the flavour of the Johnsons and they, the ones who do like them like the hairiness of them. Right. Uh, mm. You can taste it on your tongue. Whereas these ones, the flavour of the Summertons and the non are a nice smooth almond, um, and that these look good compared with the old-fashioned ones. Mm-hmm. Um, They're the pretty almonds. Yeah. So you basically got four or five varieties. We planted four or five varieties purely to get pollination. You maximise pollination for the Summertons and the non uh, Johnson's, it's great if it's there on year. But if it's there off you, you can virtually get none. Mm. But you still get the flowers. You get flowers, but they don't, for whatever reason, they don't pollinate. So in your almond butters, which which ones are you using? I prefer to use a mix of the brown skin almonds, so okay. the Sumptons and Johnston. So, but we'll use the second. So often we'll get people coming to ask us, can we just buy seconds from you? And we're like, well, the thing is we literally use every single bit of the almond. So there's not, there's nothing that doesn't have a home. And those mixed up brown skin almonds make beautiful almond meal, almond butter. So they've got a home already. And I find that the almond meal is got a really lovely oil content, real nice moisture to it because of this, you know, that variety, that style of how it's made up. Now, if I make an almond meal with the nonpareil, it's beautiful, but it's probably lighter, less oil content. So it's there is a bit of a difference. And we can always see that difference in the almond butters as well. So my preference is always to use the brown skin almonds for the almond butter. 
just for flavor, creaminess and oil content. But the non pareils will make a beautiful almond butter as well. And I think what's important is when we're making those things, we're generally using new season stock and we're making it fresh all of the time. So it's not sitting there. We, If someone orders a 10 kilo tub to make gelati with, mm-hmm. I'll have made that fresh for them. So it's fresh out and straight off to them. So they're, they're really working with the freshest of ingredients and the new season stock. And so it's it's just ready to go. It's ready to stick a spoon in and dig away, to be honest. <laughs> well, from a, from a manufacturing point of view, knowing the source of the ingredients and having that relationship is really crucial. Absolutely. So the, the main grower that we work with at this stage, um, and to be honest, I hope that my mission is to outgrow even him and to do the next flora farmer and we just keep this all going and Brilliant. growing. Yep. But yeah, the benefit of that and also being growers ourselves is we understand where they're coming from. We understand what they're going through and what their process is, but also we can talk to them constantly about um, what varieties are coming in, how much have we got this season, what can we play with, and what what grew well, you know, what went wrong. Like one year there was a really bad raining season very late in the year. Do you remember that? We lost a lot of trees down the hill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 60 of them yeah. in one hit. Yeah, it was, that's, that's not a good year just no. to say that. <laughs> and, you know, that affects the farmers. So the fact that we understand that because we have come, well, I've come from a family that's been doing that for 30 years, I will understand that with the farmers as well. So there's a great communication there and there's a great drive between us all now to really make these fluoro almonds, fluoro grown almonds, something and with their story again. It was disappearing over time due to just like Dad said, trends and changes where the fluoro region was becoming such a big wine region. It's an amazing wine region, but that meant the almonds were slowly disappearing. It's actually through those farmers markets and our relationships that we're bringing it all back to life again and getting that message out there again. And doing trade fairs like this, I know Food South Australia have really put a lot into bringing you all together here to to wave the flag for all South South Australian um, producers. But in particular, have you found this sort of environment helpful? Absolutely. So for me, the benefits of an event like the Food Bev Tech Trade Show, which is run by, you know, Food SA, as you know, and Gap Solutions, Mm -hmm. I would never have that opportunity to talk on that level with some of the um, interested parties out there. So, and also trying to present these varieties wouldn't be the same without an event like that. And then they'll they didn't realise we had these craft compostable bags and that they were an option and about the different varieties and that they're still growing down there. So it it really gives opportunity to explain more than just running into a busy store and saying, will you please buy my product? It's it's different. And for them it is too. They're not just looking at a website. Absolutely. A website, everyone's got a website. So, you know, there are a dime a dozen. But that doesn't say who the people are that's behind that website, the the mums, the dads, the grandparents, the kids that are on the farms um, working with those products, packing those products still. We've got three generations in our family that are still packing. I know our main farmer has got, they're on about their fourth or fifth generation. So there's a lot of history without these events and without Food South Australia allowing us to have a platform like that, um, we couldn't tell those stories we couldn't get those messages out and so those big buyers out there get to meet see who the real person is it's not just a website it's not just a box with almonds that there's a real family behind there well that's I mean straight to the source I mean by title it's food views and big ideas and working with producers like yourself and learning about your product and having a a platform to share through our audience is fantastic because we want to amplify the good work that you're doing and the quality product you're producing. Yeah. And some of our listeners are buyers. Some of them are chefs, bakers, you know, um, distributors, uh, home cooks. So if you wanted to speak to them directly, 
a distributor, if they're listening right now, what would you like them to know about your almonds? That there is a, a, a real family working within a business. So our eye is on the ball at all times with the product that we know the exact trees that all of our almonds come from, that we're incredibly passionate about them being good quality from the almond to the flavouring to the box we put it in and about supporting the circular um, stakeholders um, within them packets. So within them packets, my vanilla extract, I know the farm that comes from as much as possible that we can tell you every element of our product so it's transparency, it's traceability, it's provenance, quality, deliciousness. I've actually yeah, been nibbling just, away while we've been having this it's, podcast. It's easy to say that we can offer these various varieties and I am passionate about that. But what I'm also passionate about is that when they buy these almonds, there is a, a fifth generation farmer family that is bringing every generation up literally in that business and they're supporting that family and then we've created this sort of tag along relationship really and that can only get better the more support the better that can get okay everyone taronga almonds that's what you want to look out for and if people have questions where can they find you just on your website Hop on the website send us an email we've grown up and we've got a couple of emails now which is a little bit exciting <laughs> but straight on the website there's a contact to us and we'll be happy to discuss and yeah and just explain better send samples out if they want to try them um, a lot of chefs have never seen some of these varieties and that's usually quite exciting um, so yeah we're happy to just work with them well thank you very much thank, thank you. you it's been an absolute pleasure <laughs>